All right, it's recording. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our midweek conversation uh, with our special guest, uh, the Reverend Robert Bledsoe or Rob Bledsoe. Uh, Rob, it's so good to have you with us. Um, I love your sermon on Sunday. I love listening to it. And uh, I've got a few questions and comments uh, and just want to talk to you a little bit more and go a little deeper into the, the sermon today. Um, but it's just so good to, to be with you today. Yeah, this is great. No, I really appreciate the opportunity just to share a word that God had put on my heart for um, for our congregation here. And then it just felt like, you know, this could be a word of encouragement to uh, a lot more people in a lot of different places. And so really grateful for the invitation and happy to be with the folks at Mandarin. It was a lot of fun, even if it was over the internet. <laughs> Well, I, you know, we, you were talking about how we met, and it was at Florida Southern. And if I remember right, um, I was your RA for at least a year, if not two years, right? Yeah, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> I, you know, you were an RA in the, the fraternity house where I was pledging to join that fraternity. Uh, and <laughs> uh, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in my freshman dorm. I spent more nights sleeping on the couch in the house. So Technically, you were not my RA, but it felt oh. like you were because uh, I saw you more than I saw my own RA. So technically, no, but yeah, I always count you as my first year RA because it makes a funnier story. <laughs> I guess it shows you that I wasn't a very good RA knowing the roster of who I was supposed to keep track of. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. I know I've, we spent a lot of time uh, together. At, shout out to Lambda Kai. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was kind of, kind of one of my fond my fondest memories and earliest memories of you. And then obviously going to seminary together and being yeah. in a covenant group now. Uh, we've grown a lot in the last five, six years together for sure. Yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, let's get into the sermon because uh, I think it was, it was really, really well done. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I think you just did a really good job with the passage and laying out where you're going to begin with and then moving through the story and then kind of giving your kind of five points at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I want to do is kind of go through some of the larger questions that I had and, and hopefully this, we just have a conversation about it and then move into kind of some of the particulars. Um, Great. So I think the first question I had is what, what do you think made you talk about heroes um, for your church and for us on Sunday and kind of what do you, what do you think makes that so important and where we're at now? Yeah. So there was, um, I mean, I think the answer is twofold to that one a huge aspect of my own personal theology and this idea, especially as United Methodist, um, is that we're lifelong learners. It's not that you just figure something out and that's it, you know, put a check mark next to this box in your faith that you've figured it out, you know, all the answers. Um, and so part of it is this lifelong learner and we always need somebody that's our teacher. Uh, that is the one who's going to share with us something new to help us grow, learn more about ourselves, more about our faith, and the part of the journey that we're on. Um, and then the second part is I had heard a statistic or a percentage um, that my senior pastor, Tom Schaefer, had uh, said at some point in the past where I can't remember the exact number, but it was something along the lines of about over 50% of teenagers in America right now cannot identify a real life human being who would they, they would not, con they can't identify a real life human being who they would consider to be a hero in their life. Wow. And over 50% of today's teenagers can't identify that. So that doesn't have to be a family member by any means, but just someone they look up to, somebody that's investing in them, pouring into them. And so for me, I just look back at my journey and how blessed I've been to have so many mentors along the journey to get me to where I am, that when I think about an everyday hero, an everyday hero can be a mentor, somebody that just shows up and listens to us. And so it just felt like in this COVID season where, oh my gosh, all we do is question, is this true? Is this right? What's going on? And then we all have different faith backgrounds and different journeys. And so we're asking, oh my gosh, what's true about faith? What's not? I can read an article on the internet and then turn on the TV and get conflicting information from reputable sources. So uh, who can I trust? Who can I listen to? And so all of that culminated into one made me think, you know, we need to be talking about everyday heroes and how we can all be that for someone else. We don't have to change the world. We don't even have to change our own town, but can we change the life of one person and love them? So that's a, a oh, big yeah. answer for a big question, but that's, yeah. that's a huge part of my own personal theology is 
mentorship and being a lifelong learner and then sharing that with someone else. Yeah, that's really good. I think about the Methodist, Methodist kind of view on grace and you have, you know, prevenient grace, mm-hmm. justifying grace and then sanctifying grace. And when I think about sanctifying grace, I always go back to the, the house metaphor from, I think it's Albert Outler that mm-hmm. talks about like sanctifying grace is cleaning the inside of your house. And I hate, I hate cleaning. I can't stand it. It's so <laughs> frustrating. Um, because once you clean one area, another area of your space gets dirty and then you clean that area and then another space you need to fix or clean or get, it gets dirty. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's this constant repetitive cycle, um, that you're always cleaning. And that's what it reminds me of. Like, there's always something that you're learning. There's always something to clean. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, heroes are able to show us where we're, where we need to clean the spaces in our life that we're able to learn from. And that's, yeah. that's, that's really good. That's, it's that's funny you mentioned cleaning just this past Saturday, Jessica and I decided we were going to deep clean the whole house <laughs> and something we did is we're like, all right, we're starting in our, our master bedroom. And so we vacuumed the floor and then we swiffered it. And then we were like, Oh, we forgot to dust. And so then we dusted and it was like all over the floor. Oh, so we had no. to vacuum again. We had to swiffer wet jet again. So you using that example is like so timely. Because yeah. you're right, you know, just when you, you do your normal things, vacuum Swiffer, but then to do that next layer or that next step of growth out of your own comfort zone, it kind of gets everything else a little dusty and a little dirty and you got to begin oh, again. You what know? a great image. What a great image. Like, yeah, even through the cleaning, sometimes it requires, it, your cleaning requires more cleaning of other things. Yeah. Oh, that's realize, oh, gosh, I still have so much to do, so much to learn. You know, it's like the classic yeah. joke. You know, you leave seminary and you've got all this knowledge and then you try to get out there and teach it to others and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Sure. Oh, that's beautiful. And it's such a, such a, such a, it's such a timely thing where we're at in the, in the pandemic with racial injustice, with all that we're going through. Like, well, I think we're seeing all the spaces in which we need to clean now, all yeah. the spaces in which we're called to, to sh- bring the kingdom of God here in the world. So that's mm-hmm. just, that's just be- beautiful, beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask you this later on in our conversation, but I think it's really timely. Um, when you think about a practical hero for you, who is your kind of, who is one of one or two of your heroes? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny earlier uh, in the year I interviewed uh, my pastor that uh, was um, at First United Methodist Church of Ocala, which is where I grew up. Uh, and it's, her name is Sue Hoppert Johnson. Uh, she then became district superintendent, and now she is the bishop of the North Georgia Annual Conference. And uh, I interviewed her and just told her, I said, hey, you might not know this, but you're uh, one of the heroes of my life and my faith, you know, just being uh, really a trailblazer in so many different ways for not only the United Methodist Church, but uh, in so many other ways. And so she's one of mine because uh, she, she's an important person. She's a big yeah. deal. Uh, but she still takes time to answer my phone calls when I reach out to her or I need some advice. And I just respect her because she always had a 30,000 foot view of what's going on, but also uh, took time to care for me. So she's a hero for me. Um, And then I would also say another hero for me and another mentor is uh, Reverend Tim Wright. He's the chaplain at Florida Southern College where we both went. And he really was one of the first people to ever tell me, hey, God has given you a tremendous gift to lead and a tremendous gift to persuade and to teach and then to inspire others. So quit wasting it and quit wasting your time and wasting other people's time. Use these gifts that God has given you uh, to build the kingdom of God wherever you are and whatever means you can. Um, And so two people that you know, are important, but made time for me, but then people that helped me recognize something about myself that maybe I didn't fully believe yet, and then challenged me and said, don't just accept being good enough, be be the best you can be. And when we work for God and we work for the church, that's a, a mighty responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's one that I don't take lightly. And I think with all of us, it's not just as clergy or um, people who are on church leadership committees, but Jesus gives that call to all of us and the priesthood of all believers and how we're all supposed to be doing this work. And um, that's another part of being a hero, just to tie it back to the whole point of the sermon is that's all of us. It's not just a select few of us who get to do that work or are called to do it, I should say. Yeah, I think about it. So I, when I was thinking about the question, I was thinking about people that would be my heroes. And it, 
mine was a, a normal person that I've gotten to know over the last five, six, five years, uh, a little over five years now. I've been at Mandarin. And uh, I'm thinking about this, uh, this man who is in his late 90s, who comes to church every single Sunday, who was married for over 70 years to his spouse. Um, they helped start a Sunday school class. He sings in the choir. He helps out at the church office. He serves on our finance committee. Uh, this man is just, um, his name is Dan Stanley. Uh, shout out to Dan. Um, because this man, in his late 90s, has lived so much and has taught me so much about what it means to be a faithful Christian with his service to the church, with how he connected with his wife, um, just the way in which he lived his life, all the days of his life, um, as we, he and I were talking about what he did for a living uh, right before the pandemic, and he shared with me all the stuff that he had done. And uh, I mean, he's just, before I even knew that, he was a hero for me. Um, mm. But even after that, like, I, I look up to that man. He is, he is just somebody that I learned so much from. Um, mm. So he was one, just, an, I mean, not a clergy person, um, but he's just, I look up to him so much. Uh, yeah. So that would be my kind of, my one person. Um, yeah, there's another servant person, leader. A servant, yeah, servant leader who teaches me so much. Um, mm. So I, yeah, I was thinking about heroes. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't have to be a pastor. It doesn't have to be no. um, a CEO or a business person. It can be a normal person that you learn from. Um, and yeah. it's just, I think it's beautiful. And gives you the gift of time and a listening yeah. Yeah. and a word of encouragement. It's not, yeah. it's a big recipe for success. I mean, it's really simple. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was, and then I was, I was thinking, of, I was listening to an interview or a podcast or reading an article, something that was talking about Bill Gates. And he was talking about, Bill Gates was talking about his relationship with Warren Buffett. And he said that the way in which Bill Gates grows is puts himself in the room with people who are smarter than himself. And this, this is Bill Gates, like the creator of the computer. And he's like, there are people that are smarter than me. And I'm always going to put myself in the room that are with people that are like that. And like, I mean, that's what a mentor, a mentor is for me is that you're always, like you said, you're always learning from that person. They're encouraging you. They're empowering you. Yeah. Um, they're teaching you something. And uh, yeah, yeah. If Bill Gates has people that he wants to surround himself with, I think I think we can as well. I think so. I don't think that's a far stretch. <laughs> yeah. All right. So one of the other questions I had is, um, you talked a little bit about how it's hard to stand up for for the right thing, and like how we oftentimes don't want to stand out because we want to kind of blend in. Why do you think it's so hard for us to kind of to stand up for the right thing? Because oftentimes, well. I'll get to that point in a second. Let me just say, first of all, I think uh, a characteristic of most to the majority of humanity is that none of us like conflict. Uh, none of us like conflict resolution. Even if you're trained in it and you say you're good at it, that doesn't mean you like it. Um, and so I think when we're going against the grain or going against the motion that the majority are going against, um, I think you can get hurt. I think you can get emotionally hurt. You might even get physically banged up. You can get spiritually hurt. Um, and a part of being a Methodist is to do no harm. But oftentimes there are systems, there are, um, you know, to use the big theological term, there are powers and principalities at work in this world that we as Christians are called to stand up against. And what's really challenging, especially in the landscape of right now, is we're finally getting two sides of our faith coming uh, head on with one another and having to have these challenging conversations. And I think um, I personally am in a unique position as I feel like I grew up in one version of Christianity where it's follow the rules, uh, stay silent, do what you're supposed to do and be faithful and don't, don't make waves versus perhaps the more recent years of my life where others have introduced me to the work of justice and how as Christians we're called to stand up for what's right. We're called to call out the things that are not right in our world and to participate in that work and changing things and fixing things and making them better and more fair and equal for all. And as I know in my own heart, I often am, am challenged of what is the right thing for me to do right now. Um, so I think people don't like conflict and oftentimes it's hard to discern, you know, maybe some would argue with me, maybe it's not hard to discern uh, where we need to stand up and know what and stand for what's right regardless of how it makes us feel or how uncomfortable it makes us or maybe how uncomfortable it makes others 
but if you know it's right, you got to do it. Yeah, we, I think we grew up in similar households. I grew up of you read your Bible, you pray, you learn more, you grow in your own faith, you go to church, and it's all about kind of this personal piety, almost like your own personal growth, um, mm -hmm. which is really good and really important. But what, what Methodism kind of taught me, one of the reasons why I'm Methodist, is that merge, that kind of idea of piety cannot live without social justice and change. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. standing up for kind of against these principalities and powers that be. And you have to go and do something in the world for your piety to kind of thrive and live. And mm -hmm. they go hand in hand. And growing up, I never learned that. And now being Methodist, it's like, oh, my piety kind of influences the things that I stand up for and what I believe in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what I, my word of encouragement that I give myself grace with often, and often, and often, and I try to share this with others, is it's not an either or. Uh, I think it's a both and. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can't have one. You don't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the other question I had until we get into some of the particulars, um, one of the questions you asked at the end of the sermon was, how is God using you in this time in the year of 2020? Mm. Um, and, and I just think it's, I, I, there's not really a, a question. It's more of a comment. I think it's such a good question to ask ourselves. Um, to kind of reframe how we see pandemic, racial injustice, where we're at in the world. Um, it's very easy to say, woe is me. This is really, this is a terrible year. And it is a hard year. Let's just get that out of the way. It is a tough year. COVID has wrecked lives, um, killed a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. caused economic stuff. It, it's a mess. But where we're at now, and you have to express that in grief and loss, but there's something else that happens beyond that where you can say, well, what needs to be created now? What's the systems that we can create set up in place? What's the, what's the thing that God is calling me to do right now in this year, this day, this week? Um, mm -hmm. And that question, uh, it was such a good question. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I just say thank you. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on it or anything, but it was just a really good question that hit me uh, like a ton of bricks. Yeah, no, I no, I appreciate you saying that. And it's a convicting one, I think, for everyone, no matter what space in your life or part of the journey you're in. Um, you know, I, I think we've all been in different places at different times because this has lasted a whole lot longer than I think any of us thought it would last. And so I would first just say, hey, if you're in a woe is me phase right now, that's okay. Uh, be there until you're ready to not be there, until you're ready to step out of that. But I know for me, I was there, you know, we, uh, we had our first child in February and expected to have him baptized and be passed around the church. And, you know, we didn't, I was supposed to be ordained back in June and that's finally happening this weekend, which will be great. But I mean, I've had so many close church members pass away. We haven't been able to have ser uh, services. We've had to postpone a handful of weddings. I mean, there's, there's so many things going on that I just say, be kind to yourself. Um, because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of others. Um, but, but, <laughs> there's, that's a big but. We do have to be thinking about others as well. Um, because, you know, I can't, whoever's listening or whoever's watching this, you know, I can't, I, I don't know what you're going through. Um, but I know we're all go. everybody's going through something. And so if you have the opportunity or the means or the ability to be a blessing to someone else or to show love or mercy in this season, do it. Don't think twice. L let the Holy Spirit nudge you to do that work. Um, I feel like random acts of kindness are a lost art, but in 2020, they could literally change someone's day, week, month. Um, and what I've been telling my folks is just text people. If you text, give them a quick phone call, leave them a message. Nobody answers the phone anymore, but leave them a voicemail. Talk about an old school practice. <laughs> Just send an email, let people know that you're thinking about them, and that'll go a long way. That, that is the simplest way in my mind you can be a hero for someone, because everybody loves getting a notification, you know? Everybody loves knowing they're being reached out to and thought about. Send a letter. Send a personal letter. Oh, man. I love mm -hmm. it when I get letters in the mail. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think about the random acts of kindness and how it's the little things in our lives that kind of make the big difference. And mm -hmm. I've, you know... I've been thinking about kind of some of the conversations I've had over the last couple of months, whether it be with a covenant group, whether it be with Karina, whether it be with uh, somebody at the, like a lay leader at the church. Um, it's not like, um, 
my big life changes happen like in a vacuum, like they just explode. But it's these small little conversations and encouragements that kind of lead me to life change. Uh, and it's those, it's those small things. I don't know if that's how it works for you, but for me, it just works that but my covenant group, you guys have said, you know, be kind to yourself or be, be generous to yourself in this time. And it's a small side comment, but it's made the world of a difference in my life. And it's reminded mm -hmm. me, okay, I, can, I have to be generous to myself, give myself grace. And that's led me, I mean, it was probably two months ago that you all told me that to be kind to yourself um, because you've never done this. We've never done this. Where we're at <laughs> as a church, we've never experienced this. Uh, like it's hard work. And sometimes I got overwhelmed and kind of just was so hard on myself because it wasn't where I wanted to go, where, where I thought we could be. Um, so you guys saying, be gracious to yourself, be generous. It was that one little thing that kind of made a big change for me the last couple of months. Wow. So, I mean, it was that one, it's those little things that make the big difference. Um, yeah. A conversation yeah, sure. with you all, a letter that somebody had sent me. Yeah. It's those small things that make yeah. the big things. I would just say, um, since I'm down in Fort Myers, I'm, I'm a little further away, but um, I'll tell you from my heart, and I think I could speak for your heart too, nothing means more than when a member of our congregation writes us a little note or an email just to say, hey, thanks, or that was meaningful to me. Um, so if you're listening to this and <laughs> you have been thinking to yourself, hey, I really need to send Pastor Will a note, do it. <laughs> do it. There's nothing that makes us happier as pastors than to get a note. Because oftentimes when we get an email, <laughs> it might not be the most charitable email. So if you got something nice to say, go ahead and pass that along. I'll say that on behalf of Will, even though he, did, he didn't tell me to say that, but I'll, I'll add that in. <laughs> Maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll tag Cypress Lake on this uh, Facebook post. And, yeah. uh, we can say the same thing as Cypress Lake. Send yeah. Rob Blundstone notes or emails yeah. or just nice text messages or great gifts that'll make him laugh. Yeah, just tell him how fabulous he is. That'll yeah. be great. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, so I got a few things um, that you mentioned in your sermon that really made me think, brought me back to other, other stories that might tie into Mordecai and Esther. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, the story is just so beautiful. And it's a short book. So it's what, le le nine chapters, 11 chapters? Nope, right uh, in the middle. There's okay, 10. Ten, okay. It's, a sm <laughs> it's a small book, um, yeah. Yeah. but it's just full of this, these, this beautiful story. Um, mm. And it has its own challenges, like you said. Uh, there's, some, there's some troubling passages, too. Sure. But the overarching theme is so, so, there's so much imagery there. So mm -hmm. um, I had a couple questions about some of the stuff you talked about. And the first one, I don't know if you're going to have the answer to this, but we'll see. Um, you mentioned that Esther is the only book in the Bible that never mentions the name for God. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you no. know? No. I, <laughs> I literally have no clue uh, why the name of God is never mentioned. I mean, there's a phrase, there's the phrase like Mordecai was a man of God or Ma Mordecai was a faithful, you know, something. Um, but it's never like God's not name is not called upon, like in some of the earlier books in the Old Testament or in any of the Psalms or Proverbs or anything like that. So no, I don't know <laughs> why, but I think it just goes to show that we worship a triune God and the power of the Holy Spirit was working in the author of this text and working in the lives of those who decided to put it in our scriptures, especially the Old, the Old Testament. You would think, you know, back then when they didn't know who Jesus was and the Holy Spirit was still an idea, but maybe not spoken of as commonly as it is in the New Testament. But I think that's intriguing. Yeah. Oh, that, when you said that, I was like, really? Mm -hmm. I never knew that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. So, and side note, for those of you who are listening to this or recording this, this shows you that Rob Bledsoe does not know that, he doesn't know the questions I'm asking him. This is a free-flowing conversation. Yes, yes. Um, so I, I didn't look it up because I wanted to know if you knew. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess after this, I'll have to look it up. And then uh, yeah. Sorry, somebody's going to ask, back to you. <laughs> somebody's gonna ask me a question in the comments. or like, send me in that letter they write me, they're going to ask me. So P.S., <laughs> why was God not mentioned in the book of Esther? Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> Pastor Will will know the answer to that one in due time. <laughs> or Google. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay, so the other, part, the other kind of thoughts, um, there was a part that you were talking about that Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman, who was kind mm -hmm. of the general of the army or the, the power that be almost. Yeah. Um, he was a, I guess he was the chief official. And it reminded me of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're shaking your head because you probably had this thought too. I just, I think that's so interesting about like 
how those four, and I'm sure there are others, um, but that's just the immediate story that jumps out to me. How those four stood up, like literally, um, but also metaphorically to not bow down to false gods. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess, why do you think that was important in that in the text? Yeah, gosh, yeah. First, let me just say the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is one of my favorites. And another fun Bible factoid is that gold statue that they made in that in the book of Daniel was 90 feet high. Um, totally not productive to this conversation, but just so you know. Um, so they didn't bow to that statue. And then, right, Mordecai did not bow to, to Haman. And I, I don't know if anybody caught that. I kept calling him his right-hand man. And that was a little Hamilton reference for anybody who was watching. Okay, so, so side note, uh, <laughs> I'm, I've listened to the music and it's incredible. I'm mm -hmm. like 30 minutes into the musical itself and watching it on Disney. Um, it is awesome. So yeah, far. isn't it though? Uh, it's, oh my gosh. And I love hip hop. Um, oh yeah. I think it's, uh, yes, oh do. my gosh. <laughs> and now adding adding this like historical element and like uh, it's just it's I've listened to the cabinet battle number one is my favorite song so far. <laughs> nice, yeah, but you know, there's that one song I don't know the title, but it's like gotta go with the right hand man. And so every okay, time so, I would yeah. say that in the sermon, I'd be like, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> you should have started singing it. Oh gosh, <laughs> that would have ruined the sermon. <laughs> no, so I guess. Sidebar aside, why is that so important? I mean, it goes back to what we outlined as one of the general characteristics. I mean, you got to stand up for what's right, even if you know it might not be the popular thing or the right thing. But, you know, there's so many different causes, things uh, that require our attention that are vital and important. But the reality is, is we don't have the capacity, time, resources, intelligence to be present with all of those things. And so whenever I think about those two stories in particular, it's like their faithfulness to God was at the top of their list and everything else was not even a close second place. Um, and I think they would even put themselves on that list. Of, it is God, my relationship with God and my faithfulness to God is the most important thing in my life. And I won't compromise on that at all. Um, and I think that's why it's so important. And I think with this particular question, you know, I don't know if I would have gone this way in the sermon without you asking me this, but to think that's a tough question we all have to ask ourselves is, you know, when push comes to shove, what's the most important thing in your life? Is it your job? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids, your grandkids? Is it your, the work you do? Is it your hobby or is it the church? Is it God? Is God and the church the same thing? I mean, and if you had to pick, what is the most important? And I think for a lot of people, that's a tough question. Church yeah. is convenient because it's only an hour. God is convenient because I can pray to God when I need God. But how often are you making yourselves available to be used by God? Um, and then putting God over all things else yeah. in the world. I think, I, so when I think about an image, I, I, you said kind of a list, like God's at the top. I kind of think about like a circle in that God is all encompassing of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps me kind of recognize, okay, so God is in church, yes, but God is also in my work. God is also in my marriage. God is also in the places that I visit to go shop. God is also in my own personal time. God is there when I'm mowing the grass. God is there when I'm cleaning Amen. my house. God is like in the midst of all of it. And that's why I kind of think about the circle as like my whole life, God is encapsulated in everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I, yeah, it's so, that's, that's really, that's a good word. No, that's good. And I think that describes our personality as well. You, the creative wide thinker, ah, oh, I see the circle and God's yeah. involved. And for me, like the legalist administrator, yeah, the like yeah. no, there's a list and I guarantee yeah. you God's at the top. <laughs> and, and they're both good. Whatever image work helps you understand that God is, in and through and at the most important part of all of your life. I think any image works. Um, I, yeah. I, I love that, that's beautiful. <laughs> okay, so the second one I had um, is kind of the role of memory was a question and a theme I had. And I kept thinking about how Mordecai was remembering or how not Mordecai, the king was think, remembering about how Mordecai had helped him and saved him from being killed by his assassins. Right. And I was thinking about like how important memory is for us when we think about God as well and how God has been faithful to us. Mm. And, and I, you know, I, I think about the Exodus story and this is just a comment and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but I think about the Exodus story and like 
how so much of our liturgy and how much of the Jewish people do their thing based upon the memory of the Exodus story, that mm -hmm. they remember the things that God had done and taken them out of slavery. And that's mm -hmm. why we celebrate the Passover, is to remember those things. And even for us, when we do communion, we're remembering the Exodus story alongside of Jesus' actions on the cross and resurrection um, and the Last Supper that he had with his disciples. I think it's just really interesting how memory kind of sustains us and kind of equips us for where we're going in the future. Yeah. So I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on memory and what that kind of piece of the kings having memory of Mordecai kind of served for him and for us now. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess three different things popped in my mind immediately. So give God some credit for that. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is working in this conversation, my friend. Yeah. Um, the first thing I'd say is when we talk about random acts of kindness a few minutes ago, um, Mordecai didn't really get thanked for his random act of kindness to, to, to save the king at the beginning. I mean, the story doesn't really tell us how much time had passed since those two things occurred. You have to imagine it's probably been a couple weeks at least. So random act of kindness really came back to pay off later, you know, and we talk about, uh, you know, what we give to God, God returns to us in a greater way. I'll just leave it at that for that point. Um, second, when I think about memory, um, that's like almost a triggering word for me um, because I think, yeah, you know this, but my grandfather died from Alzheimer's um, and he had it for like five years and had to go to a memory care unit because my Mimi just couldn't care for him any longer and he lived there for years. And so when I think about memory and my own fear in life, like living through that, like losing my memory is one of my biggest fears um, because you know, when, when times are hard, you think back to the good things in life. Absolutely. Just right before this, I was doing a session of premarital counseling and this couple had been long distance and they said, yeah, the, I think the last fight we had was two years ago. And I was like, wow, that's really impressive. I think the last fight I had with my wife was like two days ago, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but it's this idea that, yeah, you, you remember the good and the bad, but in those seasons, when there is what seems to be like more bad than good, i.e. 2020, what are we thinking about? We're remembering all the times that were good in the past. And I think when it comes to our faith, we have to do the same things because people will, not people, but the experience is faith is not just mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. We can't go to you know, retreats every weekend and conferences to be fired up. And, you know, you and I are decent preachers, but we can't do that every single weekend for every single person. And so it's this idea that there are a lot of valleys in faith. And sometimes the valleys are two days and sometimes the valleys are 10 years, you know, and you have to remember that God is faithful, even when you might not feel it in the exact moment. Yeah. And I think that's a strong sign of spiritual maturity is when you know no matter the circumstance that I personally am going through or others are going through, while it's hard to understand, God is with us. God is present. Just as God was present in the Exodus, God was present on the cross, God was present in the tomb, God is present in each and every one of our lives for eternity, from our first breath to our last until we stand before God, when, when God's on the throne, God's there. And God is working on our behalves, even if it might not be exactly what we drew up or passed on that we'd like to have done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's so in it's, it's, just, it's interesting to me to think about like how we we look backwards in order to look forwards. So like, yeah, stuff. It's some, there's some things that are tough right now, but the thing that sustains me and helps me build kind of where we want, where I'd like to go in whatever situation in my life is looking back and saying, oh, but this time was really, really good. Yeah. And this is, there's another time that will be really, really good. And the yeah. sustaining thing in that valley is that memory of where God has spoken. Um, and I think if you're kind of waning in your faith or if you're struggling or if you're doubting, that's a perfectly normal human emotion um, yeah. and human feeling and thought. But you look back on your life and you're like, oh, I remember God in that one moment when I was – I mean, I can think about a time when I was driving and out of the blue, I just had this experience that and this is probably two years ago. I had this experience where I'm looking at the trees on I-95 and I just have this feeling that like, oh, God is there. Mm -hmm. God is here. 
in the car where I'm at. And, and the trees are, the, I've driven by those trees thousands of times. <laughs> but that something just kind of said, you have that like warming of the heart almost that John Wesley talks about. Yeah. It was just that warming of the heart moment. It's like, oh God, it's present in here, which then sustains me. And yeah. I remember those moments, even when I first experienced God, at least in the words I have of when I was a teenager in high school at a beach retreat. That mm -hmm. moment sustains me now and helps me, reminds me about the kind of the future of where I'm going, that God's present with me. So mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, you're right. It's just, God is always present with us. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's just, we can leave it at that. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> um, okay, and the last one I have, um, I love when you were talking about Mordecai and Esther and how you didn't, you said that they didn't play dirty. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't hire anybody to kill him on, which could have been easy to do. Um, <laughs> but and they could have talked back behind them or caused like a coup or what, how, but they, they really went the right way about it and wanted to talk to, it wasn't king, the king and let them, know, let him know, hey, this is what happened. This is what's going to happen. So I just think it's interesting that it was, it would have been very easy to perpetuate the violence and the revenge but they chose to stop that kind of that cycle, stop that circle. Um, and they chose to go about it the right way. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if there's a question in that, but I'm just thinking about how powerful that was when he said that. And I never thought about it before. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the end, Haman ended up being executed in the, the, the gallows, you know, to use a term we understand that he built for Mordecai. So the violence kind of ended up being full circle that he was executed. But I like, I like your thought. Uh, you're right. You know, I, they took the high road. Um, they went about it in the, I guess what you could say is a very confusing set of circumstances. They went about it in the nonviolent path as opposed to just killing him, like you said. Yeah. And I think about kind of the, the Walter Wink expression of like the third way that you don't want to, violence doesn't, violence always perpetuates violence. And there's no, you kind of, if you try to build the bigger weapon, you try to build more armies, you try to build this thing to deter, and like violence always perpetuates more violence. And yeah. I think it's Walter White that talks about the, re, the myth of redemptive violence. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a, per I've never thought about the story in this way until you mentioned it, but this story kind of, at least in the middle of it, the end, obviously it does have violence, but it reminds me that the, the right action is always not causing more violence. Um, yeah. Not building the bigger gun, not building the biggest, best thing, but always trying to stop the violence in the midst of it. Yeah, no, so, I think that's a, an important word. Yeah, and when you said that, I, it just it stuck out to me. I'm like, oh, man, that's really good. Yeah. Um, well, are there any other final thoughts you kind of would like to share with us, those of us who are listening, those of us who are watching about kind of this, this passage, um, what it's meant to you and the sermon, I guess? Yeah, sure. I guess the... The final word I'll end with for our conversation today is the final word I ended with in the sermon, you know, that in Esther chapter four, it's, you know, for those of us who grew up in church on Sunday school, we knew that Esther was a woman of courage and that, you know, the phrase is for such a time as this. And so my concluding thought and challenge would be to have, have courage to everyone who's watching, watching or listening, have courage, know that God is present with you and that God is calling you to be that mentor, to be that friend, to be that shoulder to cry on, to be that listening ear, to be that hero for someone else. And don't think it's going to happen immediately. And, you know, it, it might even take a little while for the right person to emerge, but be available. Keep your eyes open, keep your heart open for God to work in your life. And I think I think something tremendous can happen when we say, when we tell God, God, here I am, I am ready, use me. And I think God will do something pretty incredible. And I'd love to hear about that story one day, if that happens to you yeah. or when it happens to you, because I believe it will. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Can I, can I, so I had this in my notes, I didn't say it, but it kind of ties into the final thought for me. Um, Karina and I were listening to uh, Drake's old album, Say What's Real. And uh, there's one song in it. It's a title of it. It's called Say What's Real. And there's a, there's a line in it. We listened to it a couple of days ago, actually. And it's uh, the line is the, it's in the middle. I think it's the second verse. He says, 20 hours from greatness, I'm that close. Don't forget the moment you began to doubt. Transition in from fitting in to standing out. Um, I just think that as a hero, you transition from 
fitting in to standing out. Um, mm. And like, I, I think as a hero, standing out might be just being present with somebody, might be um, writing somebody a letter, might just be caring for somebody, those random acts of kindness. I think that's what Mordecai did um, and what Mordecai kind of teaches us in this. So, and Esther as well. So uh, shout out to Drake, say what's real. But <laughs> it, was in my, it was in my notes and I was like, I gotta fit this in somewhere. Uh, Glad we got it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, Rob, gosh, my friend, this is, this is I think we should, we should do this more often. At least we have conversations to. like this. Yeah, uh, thanks for the, the tough questions. I, I hope I did some justice in answering them. And uh, I'm I just really honored that you would think to have me be a part of this and uh, love the conversation. I hope it can be an encouragement to those who are participating in this with us today. Yeah, well, thank you. Those of you listening, uh, thank you for listening. Those of you who are watching, um, thank you for watching. Um, we'll have another one, uh, another guest preacher come and join us on the following Sunday. And uh, I'll have another conversation with that person uh, next week. So Rob, and to you all, go forth in grace and love and hope and peace. Amen. Amen.